Has God answered any of your prayers? Because King Hezekiah prayed, God not only delivered him from his enemies and healed him, but also supplemented two great miracles. Addition of 15 years to an otherwise concluded life and the reversal of shadow 10 steps backward on Ahas stairway. Greetings to you, brothers and sisters. It has been a great privilege studying the Word of God together with you. We have been looking at kings and their lives through the book of 2 Kings, and it was the life of Hezekiah we dwelt upon in our last study. The qualifications of Hezekiah were outstanding. He was placed par with David. The Bible mentions that not one of the kings of Judah was like him, either before him or after him. Not only is he commended for his faith in God, but was also a courageous king who rebelled against Assyria and led an army against the Philistines. Despite the many threats Sennacherib issued, Hezekiah stood his ground, trusting in God in consultation with his prophet. His fate paid off as the king of Assyria turned away, distracted by another fighting against Libna. This was a time when prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, ministered in Judah. As we continue to follow the life of Hezekiah, let us prayerfully look forward. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 8 onwards. When the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lashish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now, Sennacherib received a report from Tiraka, the Cushite king of Egypt, that he was marching out to fight against him. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Friends, the commander returned to his master and found him carrying on a war with Libna and a threatening move of the king of Egypt kept him from returning to attack Jerusalem immediately. So he sent letter to Hezekiah. A letter of warning, verse 10. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Verse 11, surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezaf, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Azar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arped, and the king of Sepharvim, or of Hena and of Eva? It was a completely disturbing message. The king of Assyria was adopting, like I said in our last study, psychological warfare. The king of Assyria had swept aside everything, my friend, in his path. How did Hezekiah think that this little nation, a strip of land called Israel, could escape the wrath of the superpower? Verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Notice what this amazing man of God does. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. My friend, we need to spread out our disturbing letters before the Lord, just as Hezekiah did. Spread it out before the Lord. He is a specialist in all kinds of things. He is a specialist, especially when it comes to problems. Hezekiah did a wise thing when he spread out 
the letter before the Lord. Verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. Notice, my friend, how Hezekiah approaches God. He approaches God in absolute humility. He gives God all the glory, the one who is enthroned between the cherubim. Can I suggest to you more prayer, more power. Less prayer, less power. No prayer. No power. A prayerless believer is a powerless believer. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrians, were 17, the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by men's hands. What the commander says is true. Hezekiah says, he's not boasting when he says that Assyria has swept everything before them and has cast each nation's gods into the fire. Verse 19, Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know you alone, O Lord our God. You know, friends, the whole of the Old Testament is a pointer towards that God. The God of Israel is the God of the nations. The reason why God performed his wonder-working acts in Israel was because he was trying to work through Israel to the nations. Nations was the ultimate goal of God's power worked out in the nation of Israel. Verse 20, then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. I have heard your prayer. Friends, we have a prayer hearing God. God says, I was listening when you were praying to me at the temple. A great man of God answered his critics who said prayer was no more than coincidence. He said, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. Friends, prayer is when God intervenes, when you take your hands off and you give it to God. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. Verse 21. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and mocks you. Can you imagine the audacity, the arrogance almost? despises you, mocks you, the daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it you have insulted and blasphemed? A little nation talking against the superpower, this is, against whom you have raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride against the Holy One of Israel. God intends to destroy the arm of Assyria. Verse 23. By your messengers, you have heaped insults on the Lord. And you have said, With my chariots I have ascended the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down the tallest trees, choicest of its pines. I have reached its remotest parts, the finest of its forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands, drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. God here, my friend, in verses 23 and 24, repeats the boast of the king of Assyria that the mountains do not stop him. Deserts do not stop him. He digs wells for water. Rivers do not stop him. 
with the soles of God's feet. All the streams of the superpower Egypt have been dried. Who is greater, the superpower or the God of Israel? Now God addresses pointedly the proud Assyrian king. He says that the rise and the fall of nations are in his own hands. As Isaiah had written earlier, God calls Assyria the rod of my anger, the staff of my indignation. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 5, verse 25. Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In the days of old I planned it. Now I brought it to pass. Ordained it, planned it, brought it to pass. Everything, my friend, that happens in a believer's life has been ordained, has been planned, and therefore it has been brought to pass. Good times, bad times, seasons of health, seasons of sickness, everything ordained, planned, brought to pass. This is God's method. Before creation, it was all ordained and planned, and now it is brought to pass. That you have turned fortified cities into piles of stone. All your fortified cities, your enemies, can become rubble, piles of stone. Isn't that wonderful? Their people drained of power, are dismayed, are put to shame. They are like plants in the field, like tender grass shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up. That is Assyria's victims. They were unable to make an effectual resistance because it was God who had put a fear in their hearts. Now verse 27. But I know where you stay and when you come and when you go and how you rage against me. Notice the words of God. I know where you stay. When you're coming out of your house and when you go to your house, I have marked you. Because you rage against me, your insolence has reached my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. And I will make you return by the way you came. God is telling Assyria, I will put a hook in your nose and a bit in your mouth. God says, you have come into my land. You have made your boast. Now I am going to do what I have to do. Verse 29. This will be the sign for you, O Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself. The second year what springs from that. And in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The Lord now addresses Hezekiah. Apparently, the presence of the Assyrian army had prevented the farmers around Jerusalem from sowing in the land. God promised that there would be enough volunteer growth to feed them. Now verse 30. Once more, a remnant of the house of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Almighty Lord will accomplish this. Therefore this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. Isaiah is making a bold statement, friends, but it is the word of the Lord. I am sure the people of Jerusalem are wondering if Isaiah is actually a true or false prophet. When Isaiah made this prophecy, people really wondered the authenticity of his statements when he said that the king of Assyria will go back empty-handed, a superpower being defeated by a power that is so small. Verse 34, I will defend the city. I will save it for my sake. 
and for the sake of my servant David. God is our defense, friends. God is our savior. And he will do it not because of you or me. He will do it because of his own goodness, of his own faithfulness. Once again, not because our conduct deserves it, but because his character demands it. God is faithful and his character demands that he be faithful to us. Friends, we come now to verse 35 of 2 Kings chapter 19. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death a hundred and eighty-five thousand men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. Remember how many were killed, a hundred and eighty-five thousand men in the Assyrian camp. Verse 36, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp. He withdrew he returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Prophecy fulfilled to its perfection. Verse 37. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nishroch, his sons Adramalek and Sharezer cut him down with a sword and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Eshradon, his son, succeeded him as king. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. Now we come to chapter 20. Here we read of Hezekiah's illness. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order. Because you're going to die, you will not recover. Hezekiah's illness is recorded three times in God's word, in Second Kings, in Second Chronicles, and also in Isaiah 38. And each account adds little more to the total picture. It must have been a difficult task for Isaiah to deliver a death sentence to Hezekiah the king. Now you notice verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully with my wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and he prays to God. Verse 4, before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, Go back, tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. This is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayers. I have seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. You know, God listens to our prayers. We all know that. But God listens mainly to our tears. Not external tears, but heart tears. When we cry from within, God listens attentively. Friends, can we make a commitment right now? You could be traveling with a transistor. You could be listening in your front rooms. You could be wherever listening to this program. But can you? Make a commitment that you'll transform your prayers into tears. That you really cry to the Lord. God loves to hear the tears of his children. And he will surely answer. Sometimes our prayers are mere words. But God listens to tears. Verse 6. I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, I will defend the city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Notice, God answers tears. Verse 7, Then Isaiah said, Prepare a poultice of figs. 
They did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. Wonderful friends, Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Hezekiah asks for a sign from Isaiah. The Lord has given me no sign whatsoever that my life will be lengthened. But then Hezekiah wants a sign. Isaiah answered in verse 9, This is the Lord's sign to you, that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back Ten steps. Isn't this interesting? Verse 11. Then the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back ten steps. It had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Shall my shadow go forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? And God answers in a miraculous way and he shows that Hezekiah's shadow goes back ten steps. A miracle, a sign that will prove to Hezekiah that he has been healed. Well, friends, God works in mysterious ways and we are confounded by his omnipotence and grace. Let me refresh your mind by summarizing our lesson into three points. First, we have a God of the impossible. To Him, nothing is impossible or too hard to conceive or implement. Whether the adversaries are kings, nature, spirits, and deities themselves. Life and death, too, are in the hands of God. Second, there is no wiser thing than to turn to God for help. God is God alone, and He alone can save. Third, the universe revolves around His plan. We all have our beings and go about our ambitions according to His design and will. It is high time to acknowledge His overarching presence and give Him the deserved honor before He rightfully yet forcefully mandates it. Keep joining us and God bless you. Music